Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Gary Bagley, Executive Director of New York Cares, New York City's largest volunteer management organization. Gary has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Gary, for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So tell us about New York City's largest volunteer organization. Well, New York Cares uh, was founded 30 years ago now, and it's grown over the 30 years into this large organization and has the scope it has because uh, I think our founding story actually tells it best, which is a group of friends in the mid-80s wanted to volunteer in New York City, and when they tried, it was too hard for a couple big reasons. The first was that they had jobs, and everybody either wanted them at night or to make some commitment that their jobs just didn't permit them to make. And the other was that the places that really needed them most um, schools, homeless shelters in New York City did not have volunteer programs. So even if they found their way to a nice person who wanted some help, the person either didn't know how they could use them, forgot they were coming, all the problems that volunteers run into. And so in, in one regard we were solving sort of two problems. One was access for volunteers and then the other was a capacity issue for nonprofits, public schools, homeless shelters, etc. Um, so everybody wanted to benefit from this, um, but there really was no way for everybody to get together. And I think what our founders realized centrally was that uh, it's management, it's human resources management, and that was what the sector was missing. And so in founding New York Cares, you know, I often say uh, what we do is run interference for everyone who has a problem with volunteering, whether it's the volunteer having easy access to a wide variety of opportunities, um, or whether it's the nonprofit who doesn't really understand how to make use of this nice person who wants to give their time. I'm very fond of saying uh, volunteers are employees who get paid with something other than money. And what what that really means is we have to figure out what the volunteer expects from this experience, what reward will look like, and then making sure also that, just like we would with an employee, what you expect of a job as you're coming in is the job we're really offering, right? So that for both um, the community partner, very often the disappointment is the volunteer who's expecting more from a volunteer experience than they have to offer. And then everybody ends up disappointed and just like in, a, in an organization, the volunteer, the employee ends up quitting, leaving, disgruntled. Uh, and they may not have had great expectations coming in, right? So we have to really make sure to be balancing both of those. But really at New York Cares, um, our focus is on that reward and recognition, uh, just like it is with staff. Um, one of the things that we did uh, organizationally to really look at this is we developed, uh, this is now going back about seven years, uh, what we have called our volunteer engagement scale. And we looked at volunteer engagement with New York Cares as an organization. And we only looked at three metrics. And one of the things that I think is so important in the sector for all of us is there are so many things we can measure. And sometimes we're just buried in numbers <laughs> and we don't know really what they all mean together. And so we took the challenge and, and picked only three things to follow, and that was how long you've been with New York Cares, how much you do in terms of volunteer programming, and then finally, how much leadership you've taken. And we have a series of ways. We, our, our leadership model goes to scale because volunteer leaders engage teams every day. So every month, 15,000 volunteer positions are filled in the five boroughs thanks to New York Cares and they're led by a New York Cares trained team leader in the field. So we looked at this model and said like the only this works only in a few ways. One is intensive training for the people who will represent us in the community and then a system that keeps people coming back. So we actually defined six levels of engagement on our volunteer engagement scale and then developed a communications plan that's designed to push people up the ladder so that they'll go to the maximum level of leadership that they would like to take. How many people do you do, do you place every day? Uh, every month 15,000 volunteer positions are 15, filled. 15,000 volunteers yeah. and how many locations is that? We're in 1,300 locations in the five boroughs 
And every year, by the way, we intake 17,000 new volunteers. Mm. Uh, the vast majority of them come through in-person orientations that are around the five boroughs. And um, also, I, I, from a mission perspective, we also believe it's important that we walk our talk. And so um, all, of our, uh, all of our orientations are led by volunteers. Um, they're our Volunteer Speakers Bureau. And again, when you get to that question of what does this person get you know, from this experience, and we find folks who love thinking and knowing that they're a representative of New York Cares in the community. And that they're mentoring other volunteers exactly. who might be their successor volunteers. Exactly, and some of them lead orientations and then they go run a, a meals project, an education program, a seniors program on the weekends. Some of them really fall in love with that leadership role and will run five, 10 orientations a month for us going to all different boroughs. So if you cluster your volunteers, I know you, yeah. I know this is kind of an unfair question, so I like if, those. if you're, if, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you provide volunteers along an incredibly broad front, but yeah. if you were to cluster yeah. um, these volunteers in terms of the types of work that they sure. do, um, how would they generally cluster in terms of uh, education versus um, uh, services to, uh, to people in need? Mm -hmm. versus services to children, adults, and so on. How, how, how do you think about those clusters? We're, we're, we have started looking at, at three big buckets of work, and one is something that attracts a lot of people to volunteerism when they first come in, which is what we call urgent needs, mm -hmm. meal service. Uh, we have a very large coat uh, drive here in the winter. We collect and distribute 75,000 coats through our volunteer networks in the five boroughs. So those urgent needs, and they add up to about 30% of our work. Um, the next portion is revitalization of community spaces, whether those are painting or gardening, working in schools and the parks, and that's about 10% of manual, our work. Manual labor. Manual mostly. labor, and folks do love it. And I, I, I have to say, I feel very good after an hour, an hour or two of weeding a community garden. I, it's, it's, it's cathartic for me, so I absolutely understand the people who love that work. And then, and this is, I think, in the New York market, what I, I always curious if people know this, but 60% of the work we do is education, starting in kindergarten and going right up through workforce development, language practice skills for adults. Uh, and one of the things that I think New York Cares always has to keep our eye on and making sure that the programs that we offer are of interest to volunteers is in many regards, you know, we're a, a good example of the curated experience, right? Our volunteers come here and they trust that if I click read at PS63M, early morning reading, that that is going to be an excellent experience and that New York Cares has done all the legwork to get you there. And then for the community partner for PS63, they believe that every person I'm bringing into that school has been prepared to come to that school and to read to kids. So as we start to think about volunteer expectations, right? On occasion, a volunteer expects, I wanna do something once. And we go, well, it's not really appropriate to come read once, right? right? We, we need to provide a longer term, you know, a, a consistent adult presence in this particular life. Now. If we're taking a group of kids, say from a homeless shelter on a field trip, and it's a one, then that's an appropriate one-time event, right? Because it's, it, it is a one-time experience for the kids and the volunteers, and we can really line that up. But that conversation is, is some of the more time-consuming work for us. Talk about the management infrastructure that's required for, uh, <coughs> to manage so many people in so many different activities, which change year to year. You have a, perfect storm of, of financial requirements, mm -hmm. uh, time management requirements, systems, yep. certainly communication um, uh, tools like, uh, well, the internet, but connected also increasingly through mobile phones and yep. how that all works. Um, that is quite a daunting challenge. And of course, everything comes with a cost. Yes. So if you become the most cutting edge whatever, the cost can be ast astronomical for yes. a nonprofit. One of the things that we've grappled with a lot at New York Cares is that for an organization our size, we need a remarkably developed technology Based, platform. Right. Um, 
most organizations our size primarily have a storefront and the primary uh, website and the primary question is how are we speaking to the various constituents who might come here and when you talk about your size what is your budget our budget is about nine million right now and how many staff we have 72 full-time we do use 10 americorps members and as i say at any given time of the year we use a lot of part-time help so the all staff email can go out to about a hundred people so a very constrained staff yes. to basically manage a workforce of 17,000 people. I well, believe. and 62,000 people a year engage with us. So they bring in, no, they bring in 17,000. 17,000 new, I'm new. sorry, new That's and then 62,000. Uh, and train 650 new volunteer team leaders a year at, while providing technical assistance somewhere you know, uh, hands-on workshop training to about 50 to 100 nonprofits a year. It's important because you're you're an operating organization that sits at a very high leverage point. So this constrained budget yeah. needs to be very carefully managed. Things can get out of hand Absolutely. pretty quickly. Well, and one of the things I, 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 when we speak about that curated experience is, you know, I often have have said to folks that you know, in, for our volunteers, they do their they do their grocery shopping online, then they sign up for their class at the gym right. online, and then they come and they sign up for their volunteer project. So our experience has to be comparable, but we're never going to have the resources to stay ahead of that the way of, of other cutting Amazon age. Amazon or, right. or whatever. Right, so, but one of the things that we have had to look at is um, is thinking about how we resource technology. And I, I remember I read in Chronicle of Philanthropy that the average nonprofit dedicates about just over 3% of its resources to technology. Right. We looked at our number and it's closer to 6%. And so that, that felt right to me. I think the other thing we think about with management, and we actually just did a reorganization around this, um, is we had our standard communications team in place, and it was you know the, the lean, mean communications team of a of a nonprofit. We need visibility because of the kinds of programs we do. So brand recognition is important. Very important, and so because we're often getting the word out about large scale projects, we we had early on in the organization's history invested in a public relations firm. I think a lot uh, sooner than most organizations would. But as we started to look, you know, a huge portion of our communications are not fundraising in nature alone, like many nonprofits maybe sort of centrally as a fundraising message. We have a huge communications responsibility to, you know, 62,000 volunteers, right. a monthly email that goes to 80,000 trained volunteers, um, all of our community partners, then our donors, and then the general public encourage volunteerism. So in a recent reorg, and this gets to sort of how we manage this, we took our communications team and we also brought together two other teams. And you know, this is sort of the HR part of this, is we have a volunteer relations team and they manage the intake of those 17,000 volunteers. Um, we have over two full-time headcount equivalent responsible for answering inquiries. We, the, you know, for whether they're email or telephone, we get in inquiries about, you know, where do I go? When do I get there? What's changing? How do I get oriented? What can I do in the Bronx? And, you know, in addition to everything people do on our website, they need people that they can talk to. And that's a very uh, important element for us because we don't want this to be solely be an online experience because at the end of the day, our mission is community engagement. And by the way, one thing we do know is that the people who spend longest with us do not come to us to meet people, other volunteers, but they stay because they enjoy that. So it's not their motivation, but it is one of those big benefits they get. So we're always trying to build that community. But so bringing communications and then volunteer relations, what I would call customer service, and our community partner relations together, as well as all the training and professional development, we brought that under one um, one department or one division and then looked at direct service programming the people who create the education programs the the parks programs etc they they're in a in a different unit um, and so right now we're sort of we're seeing sort of the benefits of bringing all those messages together becoming more consistent across all the platforms but uh, I think our single biggest question is technology and how we as an organization our size can keep up with adding new search functions, you know, uh, 
we, uh, one quick example, we were finding that people weren't going to certain neighborhoods and right. one of the, and part of it was because people didn't live there and we added a search on the website so people could start searching by subway line. Talk about your uh, previous experience yeah. because this is so fascinating. As, as we conduct searches mm -hmm. for organizations like this one, yeah. there are not that many organizations like this one. One of the things that's so interesting to me is I, I am a person, I was actually speaking to one of our younger staff members today and she's talking about you know, wanting to try this, wanting to try that. And I was like, I think that's really important. And just to be very transparent, I spent my 20s doing a different job every couple of years while I figured out where I really wanted to be in the world. And, you know, that included everything from, you know, auditing a hotel to being a trainer uh, for, you know, at investment banks. And now I look back and, uh, you know, everything I did led sort of perfectly to where I am today. Um, I did go back and get my master's in public administration, feeling like I wanted to get a better view of the social services world, and decided to go out on a few interviews and try them out. And I saw the job spec for New York Cares, and I thought, well, this is a great job. Um, and I, I'm a program director, and I had started at New York Cares as the senior director of programs before I got promoted, so um, into my current role. And, and so I thought, well, I should go talk to them and see can I do this? And, uh, and as it worked out, um, and I, I found the right boss for me and, uh, you know, someone I would call a mentor and a friend um, who also came from a totally different background. So talk about wonderful life training. Her background, MBA, um, had been the COO of an organization. So just came from a totally different angle and ended up just being a really wonderful partnership. I would say that... Um, in addition to my board being really wonderful, and of course I think they're wonderful because they promoted me, so I, I think they're they're geniuses. But they, <laughs> um, but but they they like the organization. They were willing to see the internal candidate as a 100% viable solution, right. and you know not only took me seriously, obviously, but were very respectful and, and really looked at the, at the assets I brought. I think the willingness of New York Cares from the board level, my predecessor, to engage different kinds of thinking, different kinds of talent, and then that's what we do every day with volunteers. We're trying to find many different ways of looking at talent and many ways you want to engage with the community, and we're trying to think about how to utilize that, right. not direct you into where we want to force you to go. So I, I feel grateful that I found my way to New York Cares and a, I think of my my job mainly as being not breaking, you know, what is not broken and as a, as a wonderful organizational culture. You also provide consulting services. Talk about the consulting services that you provide to other nonprofits who might also have volunteer programs. We realized that one important element of scale for us was to also be able to impact organizations that might not work with New York Cares and might not need to work with New York Cares. There are thousands of volunteers going to organizations, but not through us. But because our mission is 100% volunteer management, we've developed systems and, and de dedicate our full resources to implementing them that a lot of organizations have one person uh, to provide. So we started with a program called VIP and in during VIP we have eight training sessions beginner and then eight training sessions advanced with you know a chance to learn online and then to collaborate with your peers to develop systems and really uh, it's an first it's amazing to see how all those volunteer managers at different organizations how valuable it is for them to get together because they all have the same problems, to hear that there are solutions, uh, to have a forum to think how these solutions and practices translate to their specific environment um, is, is tremendously valuable. Um, what's interesting for us is we also found the organizations that we already work with that go through VIP actually start using us better and more strategically, and we do twice as much programming at those organizations because they've figured out how to better use the resource, and then our volunteers like going there even more because the volunteer manager that we provide is better, the environment is more welcoming, and volunteers are being used 
more effectively. And a very practical curriculum, a curriculum that you cannot find at any university. Right. You can't find it at a community college. You have to go to those people who have the experience of volunteer management to learn this, these types of skills. I think of volunteer management and fundraising as being two of the things that people in the nonprofit sector do the most and where there is the least training to do them. You know, most, most organizations start as voluntary groups before they even become a 501c3. And we spend so much of our time doing that which we got no training in. Uh, so I, 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 first, I'm glad New York Cares provides a service and I hope that more universities, colleges, companies start providing more training on volunteer management. A huge portion of our workforce is voluntary and we need to really start thinking about how we, how we make sure that we recognize it as being necessary, not just a nice thing that people do, but really necessary to the health of the sector. Well, Gary Bagley, thank you so much for thank sharing you. your work at New York Cares with us and thank you so much for your insight. Thank you, it's wonderful to speak with you.